Hello and welcome to The Eight Club. My name is JJ Bola and I will be your host. Fellas, we good? Yeah, yeah. Good. Good, man. Name one trait you hate about other men, but name one trait you love about other men. So one trait you hate and one trait you love. Donny. I hate that men think that strength is physical only. Mm. And I love the fact that men have physical strength. That's, that's a sick answer. I'm not even speaking no more. Right. I'm not even speaking no more. Can't beat that. Are you doing a sip of wine now? Yeah. Yeah. And that's a wrap. Yeah. 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 Hate and love. Hate and love. One thing hate and love it's about men. I think lack of acceptance or our lack of education around this word I like throwing in, which is metacognition, our thoughts, thinking about our thoughts. I think a lot of us men aren't trained to do that. Um, the and thing I love, love, you know what? I think the depths we're willing to go to, to run away from something that is so powerful from us. But when we stop running, we're going to realize that's been our core strength for so long. Mm. Okay. Yeah. So like that internal strength, yeah. So I mean, I had to compete with you, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> <laughs> do you know what? Because I had a quote, yeah? No, I had a quote, yeah, and it was, um, if emotions are so weak, why are we the ones running away from it? Right, and I was like, trust. Okay, so what do you want to pass? Come on, come on. Hey. What, what about you, Jordan? Oh, crikey. Um, <laughs> what about you? Hate is a strong word, but it is a, a trait I suppose I could argue to dislike is we can come to a decision quickly and be set on that decision. One thing I do love about men. Um, Aside from when they're shirtless, um, is uh, <laughs> no, so but just, hold on, hold on, because no. we're all assuming that wasn't my answer. Then. I was just throwing that in quickly what? as a curveball. Are, are they ripped? What about shirtless, shirtless, a bit of belly, <laughs> shirtless abs? What? What's going on? Bro. I'm here for a dad bod. Well, let's just say oh, yeah, yeah. I love a good dad bod. Well, I saw a man last night, so I got a few ideas in my head at the moment. So man, make an overall impression. Hey. Oh. Yeah. Mm. That, that wasn't my actual answer. I'll just throw that in quickly. Um, Yo. But no, this it, is what you love. My, right? Yeah, my Get actual some answer more wine, man. is. <laughs> <laughs> my answer is sacrifice. Men are so willing to sacrifice for those they care about that it truly is admirable the pain they're willing to put themselves through for the betterment of those around them. That is something I love and admire about them. Yeah, I don't know that men are um, so willing to sacrifice. I mean, I think as men, if we accept that as men we have um, status and, and power and, and privilege, um, are, are men prepared to sacrifice that? Are men prepared to, to give that up? Uh, you know, I know some extremely sacrificial uh, female. I don't. So, I, so for me, I would disagree um, that, that that sacrifice is a instinctively male oh, I'm trait. Not saying it's instinctively male, but um, there are. I know a lot of guys who have really oh, for sure. put them through a lot of pain and, and mm. suffering for the betterment of those around them. Moments when you can't cope, moments when you're at your lowest point, do you have someone you can turn to? Like, oh. I was raised in like a Rastafarian household, so for me, like, the most high is the person I would turn to in that moment. The most high, do that. Do you mean, hierarch like hierarchy-wise? No, like, God, like, the most high. Should I be caught catching myself in my lowest moment, which is by myself, usually, right? It'll be the most high that I'll Does everyone have someone to turn to? I'd like to believe so. Who do you turn to, Jordan? I'd say if it was particularly bad, I know that, like, I felt really, really down before, and actually one of the things that put it in perspective for me was by speaking to my mum. Yeah. Because, you know, that's someone who's, if regardless of their how they're feeling and whatever else, they ultimately want you to stay alive, do you know what I mean? So it's like, you can trust, you can trust that. Mm. Unconditional love, innit? Yeah. Because for me, I thought there several times like that. Although I have people around me, sometimes I don't have a way to speak to them about whatever it is I'm going through. Yeah, I've had periods like that, actually, where like, kind of ostracised myself through whatever depression I was going through. And like, not being able to release and not being able to speak to people was like a real problem. Yeah. And it like it ended up that I like I would just sit at the university bar and I would just like chat to random people and it was a really unhealthy way of dealing with my emotions. 
It was kind of probably not something I really wanted to talk to my my mum yeah. and my dad or my family about. What were honest. you going through at that time to get to that stage? To right? be honest, it was to do with a relationship that broke up. Um, and it was the relationship that broke up. That, mm, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, you all know, you know. Yeah. Yeah. I felt incredibly like my pride had been really hurt. Like my ex was completely within her rights to go and get with this guy. I, I was quite close to him. Um, but my pride meant that I didn't feel able to like talk to people about it because they had known all of all this stuff. They had seen me and her together. They knew this guy. When guys are going through great periods of stress uh, and they're experiencing things that are holding them back and causing them pain, they'll keep it to themselves and not tell their partners. Like, there's cases all the time of men who uh, die by suicide. Mm. And the family and the, the, their wives or their spouses, their children, like, we just didn't know anything. Yeah. And then they'll learn afterwards from notes, from private messages from other people, is that they didn't want to be a burden on their family around them, that they mm. think, Oops. What did you do so, in those moments then? Oh, in my teenage years, it was drink. Yeah. It, it was like drink late teenage alcohol. years, early 20s. It, yeah. it was, yeah, that was my way out. Like, just dissociate myself from people and put myself, like, like as you said, you're just turning to a yeah, 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 yeah. Smoking weed was my thing. Yeah. I would literally go home and be like, do you know I'm going to smoke a joint because this will help yeah. me? And like, only recently have I realised that, like, that never helped me process anything. That was all about suppression. Um, I'm actually quite opposite to a lot of these views. So luckily for me, I have, like, a great support system. But I guess more so now, I think before I was out, and I was very limited and restricted. Mm. So all of the things of like holding things to myself, not being, um, not showing any signs of weakness, not giving into intimacy, like all those things I felt like I had to perpetuate. And then once I kind of came out, it kind of got stripped completely. And after that point, like it was like an open book. So I literally haven't had any mad lows since that point. I mean, I can really relate to what Donnie was saying because I had like a really bad breakup and I was really depressed and I had people just like come and just be with me for like days and I remember thinking you know people just come and sleep in my bed and I was thinking how how would straight men <laughs> react to like a breakup as bad as this and my flatmate at the time was like I would just go and find somebody else yeah, I, I went through, a, the reason I'm actually probably here is because I went through a really bad breakup last year and what saved my life really. And it's, I think I would have liked to say my mum or my girlfriend who does help too now, uh, but like my therapist, I yeah, want to say, yeah, yeah. <laughs> like I went to, th I was in therapy and yeah. the woman saved my life and, and the act of it saved my life. There was all types of, of, of conflicts occurring within me. I felt like I couldn't speak to some of my male friends because of some unconscious fear that in me showing myself as that mm. weak, it would, mean, it would push them away. And it was, that, it was that neutral space where she was like, actually the reason why you can't cope with something that fundamentally everyone goes through a breakup at some point is because you need to be able to push yourself out of it by understanding what's at the root of that. Can I, can I Did, jump on the back on that? Yeah. Thank you for sharing that because I'm surrounded by a lot of female friends and a lot of the time they complain to me about, oh, I've told my partner that they can confide in me. They should be comfortable enough to, because I've said that they can talk to me. And it doesn't solve anything. Right, cool, you've now made me aware or exposed me to the fact that you actually feel comfortable to sit in a room with me and talk about my issues. You haven't made me feel comfortable mm. to tell my issues, whereas the therapist had did that. And yeah. I, guess, I mean, like, I feel that it's a necessary space, upskilling that needs to happen in our social circles where we can enable people like this conversation is currently doing to facilitate that conversation. Does everyone feel comfortable going to therapy though? Because it's very stigmatised. I feel like everyone, especially men, but everyone should be in therapy. Yeah, yeah. Um, I've, I'm in therapy, I've been in therapy. Um, I don't know that I ever want to not have therapy, That's quite awesome. frankly. It took for me to have a breakdown, it took for me to have a, a crisis moment um, before I took that step. Mm. Um, but then coming out of the other side of that, I definitely saw how, like at the end of the day, mental health is just like, it's just like your physical health. Like we all have one, you have ups and downs. And you don't wait until you're overweight or unfit before you start going to the gym or eating healthily. It's all part of maintaining that balanced diet. And I think that going to therapy and kind of talking through those issues um, is just something that you should do in order to keep your mind healthy. I think, especially now in our current generation, we are disrupted more than any than has ever happened before. Like, I think that needs to be clear. Like with the advances of technology, we are so disrupted and so distracted that there needs to be a way more conscious understanding of how much we can avoid how we feel. I think that people are so hardwired into surviving in that, in that facet, they're not looking to learn any other way. If a man looks at masculinity as his spine, 
removing that spine does not make sense to him, mm. right? And it's like monkey swinging. You're not going to let go of that monkey bar until you realize that there's one enough that you've actually held on now really that exists and that you can rely on. And until we see that the vulnerability as something that can still be relied on, we're not going to let go of it. Yeah, and I feel a lot of us like, so you're saying to a certain degree, correct me if I'm wrong, that like masculinity is shifting or it has been shifting. It, it, it is shifting, clearly yeah. it's shifting. It's not a, a See, I, I had a lecturer at uni who used to describe masculin masculinity. She always used to describe it as someone being in touch with their masculinity mm. and toxic masculinity is being out of touch with it. As masculinity as an essence isn't innately wrong or evil. Actually, it's very much a part of society well, and now there's people talking about masculinity as if it's like as if it's because the, because the form of masculinity that's taken so much precedence is the toxic form right there's like the the masculinity that we see at say football games or do you know what i mean the masculinity yeah. we see when we see a group of guys sat at the pub shouting do you know what i mean yeah, Just, yeah, you yeah, know yeah, that yeah. kind of masculinity but there's a whole other type of masculinity yeah. going back you were talking about like friends who share beds and stuff like that when i was talking about that really horrible time i went through the way i got through, the w the person who i turned to was actually one of my straight friends and we ended up sharing a bed for six months he went through the breakup i went through the breakup yeah, ben, who's deep. your brethren bro oh, is it? <laughs> Dude, the guys moved to new york i feel like i've lost a limb about. i'm telling you but we, we literally we shared a bed we would sit and we would like Whatever, it was just like a way of being comfortable. But I'm that's saying it was like the sharing the bed concept is like wow, cool, that's happened. But how do you get to that? Do you know what I mean? Say if we're boys, yeah, and then like okay, we're both going through something. How do we get from that into bed? To it was it went all well. It was to be honest, it was vulnerability. Number one, I'd gone through my breakup and had had done all that weird shit where I was just like sitting at bars, just getting pissed. Mm -hmm. Then he went through a breakup and he was that like deep, deep depression. Yeah. And I spent like two days of just like nursing him in bed. Then it became like a week, then two weeks, then three weeks. Yeah. And then it just ended up that we were just doing it for about six months. Like it wasn't not masculine. It wasn't like I lost a form of my masculinity. Mm -hmm. It was like, do you know what I mean? It was like we engaged with it in a really beautiful way. Yeah. Um, That's why like, I like talking about masculinities rather mm -hmm. than masculinity. Exactly. Mm -hmm because there are just so many forms of it. Mm -hmm. We have an idea of masculinity and that becomes toxic or that becomes like a negative stereotype where masculinity allows any person, be it you know, man, woman, gender non-conforming person, to access their masculinity. Cultures of old, and there are still some cultures that do it today, would have, when boys were hitting puberty, would give them a rite of passage yeah, right to passage learn to be understanding of what it means to be a man and to bond with your fellow men. We don't have that today. Like if we did, the, the act of you sharing that bed with your best friend and appreciating the pain you're going through and understanding and acknowledging it would be normalized because you'd be able to make yourselves vulnerable and the differing masculinities you've got, you could communicate. I think that yeah, might be kind of painful for like someone like me though, I think. I don't want a ritual into like manhood because that's mm. not something that I conceive for myself. Right. So why am I being initiated into something that isn't where I exist most of the time? Like I'm a femme person, I love my feminist. My like initial reaction to being around lots of straight men is probably one of like fear. Yeah. And but it's like I think there's like a a fear that yeah, that I that my legitimacy as a human is like not accepted. So especially as someone who like defines as like gender non-conforming and is like my my fear of like that not being allowed in that space sort of ups and ante yeah. when you're around people especially the more privilege you have if you're a white straight cis het man mm -hmm. middle class etc etc you know your uh, your need to kind of consider what my existence is becomes mm -hmm. less and less i was on a tour recently with um a uk grime artist and it was like only men and it was very hyper masculine yeah. and Everyone was really polite, everyone was really fun and friendly, but I felt so, I've never felt so dry as a person. I felt like I had no personality. I felt like the most Why? bland person because I had no one to bounce off of. So I realized that the energy wasn't there. Like, yeah. the energy, it wasn't toxic though. It wasn't, there was toxic traits, yeah. but it wasn't to the extent where I felt uncomfortable. Okay. I just didn't feel comfortable. And that's what happens, especially around, I realized that something happens mm. around straight males mm. because I'm supposed to be palatable. Yeah. That's me as a black person yeah, as well. Yeah, yeah, if yeah, I'm yeah. around predominantly uh, white people, for example, my role is to make sure you feel comfortable. Mm. You get all the references. I'm going to talk about all the programs and shows that you like. Oh, Game of Thrones. Like I can't talk about Insecure because that might be a bit too, yeah. too black. Yeah. And now I can't say that. Same with 
in that environment, I can't talk about RuPaul's Drag Race. They don't know about that. Yeah, like, yeah. Even in this conversation, the default setting is straight. Mm -hmm. They have to add something so we can get involved, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. So had we grown up in cultures that perhaps were more gender and sexual fluid, we would see homosexuality as a norm, because I know that in certain cultures, particularly as a culture in West Africa called the Dagara, where people who are sexually fluid and gender fluid as well were seen as like higher yeah. spiritual people, you know? And so it's like, we don't have that in the Western world. I think that almost can work with what you were saying, how because you identi identified with your feminine energy, uh, hopefully I'm not misinterpreting what you were saying, so I think that can work into becoming a man, because I would consider myself a man. I don't, I have, I don't want that, though. For what reason? When you say you don't want that? Just so that I can understand I, what your I position is. I don't want to have to exist in this world as a man. I want to exist in this world as a human being. Mm -hmm. What would differentiate the two, then? Like an emancipation from the gender construct and the norms that we're put on ourselves. I just heard like a in my head, sorry. <laughs> no, that, was, that, was, that, was, that was so sick, sorry. Just, yeah. To maybe answer, because I'm intrigued by what you're saying in terms of a rite of passage, because it's something that I've been thinking about a lot. And I'm, I definitely am in the ballpark of, of deconstructing gender expectations, for sure. But I think the reason why it was a co it's a conversation is because, especially actually for heter it heteronormative yeah. men, they're, they're, you, the privilege that you may have in the world that can totally accept you is that you can run from pain for so long mm. that when it actually catches you, mm. do you know what I'm saying? But the proximate to pain, you will feel it, it will be experienced regardless of, your, of how you feel about yourself. Someone will die, someone will break up with you. And it's your ability to handle that that I believe progresses all humans. Women have various aspects in their like, biological uh, development mm. where they have to almost accept pain, at, well not almost, accept pain and powerlessness as, as, as a, a very much a part of, of maturing. There was a conversation I had recently regarding how we as, as people who identify as being men, right, violence is our key communicative tool, right, so inflicting pain on someone else is how I got my best friends as a kid. Uh, Starting a fight with someone was like, oh, now we're friends tomorrow. Uh, so when you speak about proximity to pain, I feel like a lot of us have understood that for us, again, that whole survival thing, that whole, this is how I communicate, right? Inflicting pain on someone else stops me from feeling pain, mm. primarily, or letting people in their room know that I can inflict pain on you will stop me from experiencing pain. Yeah. So when you speak about proximity, it has to be, we have to speak about the nuanced relationships we have. No, no, you're, it's, it's your individual, so that's an avoidance. Right. One thing that I've realised is, Everyone here agreed with experience in a certain level of like rel relationship, heartbreak, pain, and also fear of being vulnerable. When was the last time you cried, Jordan H? Whew. Okay, uh, last time I cried, my girlfriend had a cat called Kitty Cat, and <laughs> <laughs> I love how this story starts. Yes, um, and I grew quite attached to this cat. And and then we learned he had a tumour on his stomach and only had a couple of days to live at best and he had to be put down. And I remember saying goodbye to him and my last words to him were good luck. And walking down the stairs just tore me to pieces because I knew what I had to go through and I can fuck, I feel it welling up now. I know it sounds silly, it's a cat, like get over it. I mean, people eat cats on the planet, but for me, it's just like I was so attached to this cat. For me, there was so much emotional value and, and my girlfriend was very upset as well. And, we were sort of like bouncing off each other, the fact that we were both like crying and upset mm. um, about the fact that this cat had to be put down. That, that got to me. But that touches us, isn't it? It touches yeah. our hearts. Like a, there's an empathic nature that we have, even as men, especially how it's even been repressed. So, Adam, do you relate? When was the last time, when was the last time you cried? Me, um, New Year's Eve. Um, I spent my new year um, crying coming into 2019. I think I was in such a dark place or at, at, um, had such a difficult year and ended the year in such a difficult way. Um, for me, even just the, the prospect of entering into a new year. What new was it around? What was involved in Just, just life. Um, you know, relationships, relationship breakdowns, um, access to my son, mm -hmm. um, um, and, and feeling that you know a lack of a lack of control of those circumstances. For me, the the idea of coming into a new season, a new period. Um, and feeling like that's not going to change or that that's not going to get any better. For me, that was like, 
Yeah. Mm. Were you just... sharing that with people? Or was it you just... Nah, it was nah just not in, in, at that moment, nah. Um, Why not? Because I, I didn't want to, didn't want to, like, I, there's, there's, I knew there was people, people that, yeah, people, absolutely, yeah, okay. yeah, I knew that there were people that I could share that with. Yeah. In that particular space, I wasn't seeking solutions. Yeah, you I wasn't cried. seeking that's, that's, that's help. Just, you're in the you know what I'm saying? Yeah. I, I know that if I, yeah. if I share it with you, you're going to want to help me. You're going to want to come around and stop me from killing myself or, or whatever the case may be. So this is not about help. It's not about, you know, I mean, the I, 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 last thing I want for you to do when I'm in that place is for you to prevent me from, from doing that. Do you know what I'm saying? And so how do we break that and, and can show up? guys, hey, it's okay to be like this or like this or like this else that's healthier versions of ourselves. Part of overcoming that and deconstructing that is um, just literally by taking the steps to be vulnerable, like by me exposing myself to yeah. you and, and being vulnerable with you, um, it in turn gives you the, the, the liberty to be vulnerable with me. Yeah. Um, and. And that helps me to overcome that, that fear of vulnerability. So it's encouragement to be vulnerable, <laughs> yeah? Someone is vulnerable to me. My immediate response is advice, and we can do this, we can do this, and you're kind of like, you're like, checklist, how can I deal with it? And actually, I think one of the things that men don't, we're not vulnerable when we support people. So actually, what you would probably need in that situation is like, I'm here, I love you, I don't need to give you anything else. That's a beautiful note to, to wrap up on. Hey, club. Oh. I didn't want to end it.